This is part three of chapter 14, The Rape of the Mind, The Psychology of Thought Control, Menocide, and Brainwashing by Juice A. Merlou, M.D. Picking up where we left off. Among the recruits for the Nazi police force in the occupied territories were turncoats of all sorts and even the inmates of asylums for the criminally insane. The pathological grudge these people had against society was the foil by which the Nazis turned them into traitors. The Germans themselves despised these men, but they were cunning enough to put them to the best possible use. The Nazis also played a strange game with some authors and artists who had not received enough appreciation. The enemy flattered these men by buying and praising their work. The artists were first told that they could write and create as they pleased without fear of interference. Gradually, little political services were asked of them tiny little concessions like a favorable report of a meeting or a favorable reference to a philosophy with which they did not agree. It is the impact of that first little concession that starts the inner avalanche of self-justification that finally leaves, leads to self-betrayal. Following the first compromise and self-justification comes the second, and this one is met with shrewder self-exculpations. After all, the compromiser has had experience in rationalization by now. The repeated concessions turn into submission and voluntary cooperation. As I said before, once a man is seduced into a small ideological concession, it is very difficult for him to stop. From now on, his imagination produces enough justifications which help him maintain his self-respect. The inwardly insecure trader always feels the urge to identify with the enemy, the hostile invader. He has never belonged, never had a feeling of identification with his own group, has never felt the rewards of such cohesion, nor has he won the love, sympathy, and respect of his fellows. Therefore, he wants to join the others. He may even go so far as to call his former friends traitors. Lord Ha Ha, William Joyce, the British traitor who was executed by his government, considered himself a real Aryan German and in this way justified his fight against England. In the hectic days immediately following, following the Nazi invasion of Holland, I myself felt an occasional inner temptation to go over to the enemy, to the stronger party with its powerful organizations, all ready to support one, to back one up. I even had a dream about visiting Hitler and convincing him in a childish and friendly way of the righteousness, righteousness of our cause. I did not succumb to this dream temptation, but there were a few who fell for such infantile pictures and were unable to withstand their need to submit. The need to conform, to be accepted, to be safe and respectable is deeply embedded in man. In our analysis of the inner forces that lead men to surrender their mental integrity under the pressure of prison and concentration camp life, we saw how important a role this mechanism plays. Living in a country occupied by the enemy is no is by no means a horrify, as horrifying as living in a POW or a concentration camp, but it is nevertheless frightening. And in this frightening situation, the need to conform may show itself in surrender to the enemy ideology. Those who resisted this need, even though they felt it, usually became even more fervently anti-Nazi as a consequence of their guilt feelings about this impulse to treachery. This war experience taught us another truth. Traitors can be made by overwhelming collective suggestions. In the ambiguous chaos of shouting ideologies and changing values, the mind becomes sullen and stubborn. And where there is immaturity and lack of inner control, it may become confused in its loyalties and simply surrender to the most powerful group. The Nazis, with their perverted political methods, tried to supply the weak, the ambitious, the disgruntled, and the frustrated with a ready-made set of bogus ideals to justify surrender to their side. In Mein Kampf, Hitler says that when the disappointed are given a sense of importance, they will swallow every suggestion with the utmost docility. He knew that human weakness, even kindness, can be used as a starting point, point for a systematically nurtured conversion. Hitler knew, too, that unlimited political terror could make a traitor of almost anyone. Spread fear, terror, and hunger, inflict penetrating pain, and finally, as a result of mental coercion and growing confusion, many will succumb and even betray their own families. 
and many of the concentration camps, the victims themselves were in charge of the gas chamber killings and kept their gruesome jobs until their own turns came. Fear and terror had made willless slaves out of them. There is still another human characteristic that can lead to treason and betrayal. There are some people who simply do not know where their loyalties belong. The case of Klaus Fuchs, ah, I like that name, Klaus Fuchs or Fuchs, the man who betrayed atomic secrets to Russia is a dramatic example of this. I guess he has a perfect name then, right? Here was a highly intelligent person and an, an expert on the most difficult theoretical problems lost in a sea of conflicting loyalties. Because of the Nazi persecution of his Quaker family, he adopted a new fatherland, England. In the meantime, he carried a dream of mystical universal of a mystical universal world which he thought to find in the totalitarian ideology. In the midst of his confusion about world problems, he simply did not know where his loyalty should be. This was not a case of schizophrenia or a Jekyll and Hyde situation, as the newspapers reported, but a case of confusion of loyalties in a hyper-intellectual mind. Fox did not know emotionally where he belonged. In other cases, people were literally pushed into treason and, treason and collaboration because nobody in their environment trusted them. This happened, for instance, in Flanders with the collaborators of the First World War. Several, several of them were compelled to become collaborators again. This analysis of the factors that lead men to treason certainly does not imply that every man must remain loyal to the group from which he has originally received his morals and ideals. Better insight and higher ethics may override our childhood loyalties. It is the fate and the need of human beings to go beyond their teachers and to correct, if possible, the traditional rules of their schools. The great philosopher Socrates was accused of being a traitor because he corrupted the minds of the youth of Athens, and yet today we know that Socrates was far from being a corrupter. Our treacherous intellect. Perhaps the most tragic form of unobtrusive treason and self-betrayal is caused by the inertia of the human intellect. We are often betrayed by our own minds. We forget completely what we want to forget. We deny the existence of real problems in order to retreat into wishful thinking. As soon as we do not understand and feel the implications of a problem or an argument, we tend to submit passively to the most powerful side, just as did the over-friendly barber. The ease with which human beings can be corrupted is still one of our most serious psychological and moral problems. Inner confusion can make us submissive to almost any strong suggestion from the outside, no matter how foolish or safe. Our doubts, our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. There are other more complicated tricks of the intellect which lead to self-betrayal. The feeling of inferiority, which often arouses in ignorant people a great desire to grasp extremely difficult ideas. Such people like to identify themselves with a quasi-profound system of thought. Hitler and his abstruse writings made temporary pseudo-philosophers and magicians out of the majority of, of the German people, all dictatorial totalitarians by the services of scholars who can make them such a set of pseudo-philosophic justifications. Unfortunately, some scholars are easy to buy. In Holland, for example, there was not there was a not-too-intelligent philosopher who became converted to Nazism after it had shown its overpowering strength. Thereafter, he felt free to write on the most abstruse philosophical subjects and to expound the most complicated theories, all for the glorification of his powerful friends from the Third Reich and their myth of conquering the whole world. At the same time, he built a system of inscrutable words around his own deep feelings of guilt. He isolated himself from the world more and more because no words were convincing enough to satisfy his treason to himself. In the end, he lost all contact with reality. Then, of course, the Nazis had no use for him either. And that's where I'll stop. That was part three. And I will see you in part four. We're reading from The Rape of the Mind. 
The Psychology of Thought Control, Mendocide, and Brainwashing by Juiced A.M. Malou, M.D. Love that nutcracker.